Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Advanced Liver Tissue Model for Improved In Vitro Prediction, presented by Matthew Shipton, Chief Operating Officer, Hugh Rell Corporation. My name is Xavier Gutierrez, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Matthew Shipton. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Xavier. And thank you to the folks at LabRoots for giving me the opportunity to present on more advanced liver tissue model systems uh, to improve in vitro prediction. Uh, topics I will be covering as a brief overview, uh, various advanced liver uh, model systems. I'll give an in-depth review of the Curel system where I'm currently chief operating officer uh, and talk about our functional liver model. I'll also talk about some of the next generation microfluidics. I'm sure many are familiar with the organ on chip systems that are widely popular and becoming more and more popular. There are three uh, very well-known uh, advanced tissue systems that are out there for um, in vitro liver prediction. Uh, the Hurel system, which is a uh, self-assembling co-culture system, uh, bioreclamation IVTs hepatopac, which is a micro-pattern system, as well as uh, in Sphero, and they're miniaturized uh, spheroids that can form um, miniaturized tissue models. A uh, number of companies are also using the commercially available ultra low attachment uh, plates uh, and primary hepatocytes to create their own spheroids. As I said, our Hurel system is a self assembling uh, co culture comprised of primary human hepatocytes co cultured with non parenchymal stromal cells. Here you can see a, uh, differences with the system. Uh, in the Hurel human, the Hurel primate, Hurel dog, and Hurel rats. The thing about um, our Hurel system is, along with the spheroids, is they're amenable to a variety of different plate formats and um, uh, culture techniques, uh, unlike some of the micro pattern system that's currently on the market. Um, here you can see a nice example of our self assembled Hurel co culture, where for the rat model, where you can see the primary hepatocytes as kind of the islands that are formed in the middle and then filled in with the non-parenchymal stromal cells. Many of the systems are now adding Kupfer cells to create more physiologically relevant uh, liver environments. As Wynn et al. at Merck had researched, the hepatocyte Kupfer cell model can generate crosstalk between the cytokines and inflammatory response for a more holistic in vivo-like picture. So many of these um, first primary hepatocyte models, maybe with one or, uh, other cell type, are now offering three and four different um, cell types in one uh, nice package. So essentially creating a miniaturized tissue on a plate. For those that are familiar with primary hepatocytes in the liver, uh, the systems form beautiful bile canaliculi, so you can study a variety of bile acids or look at metabolites that can be formed in the bile ducts. Some of the early work that we did here at Curel in comparison of our co-culture with the traditional plated hepatocyte model is to look at the RNA expression. These data were presented by BMS, and you can clearly see here the P450s and some of the non-P450s that are expressed in the Hural uh, hepatocyte co-culture over a period of time all the way out to 72 hours. So you can see, for example, the P450s 1A2, 3A4 
are relatively high and expressed, and even some of the non-P450s like AO and FMO are also expressed. So the um, culture is acting essentially like a, a miniaturized liver on a plate. One of the uh, concerns uh, that many companies have is as we progress towards uh, more difficult to metabolize compounds, companies are having issues trying to figure out the best way to examine the properties of these compounds in vitro. Uh, this was a major concern for a, a CRO called Q squared, who wanted a reliable in vitro liver system uh, that they could test some of their client compounds on because they were having issues bringing uh, predicted value the current uh, suspension of hepatocytes that are available. One of the experiments was to examine different compounds, both low clearing and rapidly clearing, and compare it to the traditional method of primary hepatocytes used in suspension, plated hepatocytes on a monolayer, and the hepatocytes in our Hurel co-culture system. You can see here the uh, various experimental design that Q squared had chosen to use. Some of the things uh, from the compound selection test set that Q squared wanted to make sure of were that these 13 compounds were minimally, minimally renally cleared and that the clearance uh, rates could be determined by estimation of substrate depletion and that the uh, these intrinsic clearance values could be scaled up. Um, here you can see the, the different compounds that were selected as well as the main metabolizing enzyme involved for each one. The calculations that were used to come up with the values for uh, these results on the next slide. And here are the results. And you can see the drugs uh, that were screened on the far left column. Uh, the next column is the literature in vivo clearance value. And then the predicted clearance value for the hepatocytes in suspension, hepatocytes plated on a monolayer and inside the Hural system. And you can see for many of the low clearing compounds like warfarin and timolol theophylline, there was no value predicted for the hepatocytes in suspension because these compounds were so difficult to turn over, they could not be turned over using the uh, traditional suspended hepatocyte method. Uh, for a long time, the next step or plan B was always thought to be, let's plate the hepatocytes and this would give them longer time, longer exposure, and we should be able to predict clearance. Unfortunately, because uh, once you begin to plate hepatocytes, their uh, enzymatic function activity begins to drop off almost immediately, uh, you, they were able, not able to get any type of predictive value uh, for even some of the moderately cleared compounds. While in the Hurel system and some of these more advanced systems, because they're able to maintain the high enzymatic function that you receive with suspended primary hepatocytes in a plated format all the way out to 72 hours. You're able to get prediction for, for compounds that are tough to metabolize, like the warfarin, the timolol, the offaline, and a number of others. I will say many of these advanced systems, if you look at the bottom of this slide for some of the more rapidly turned over compounds like the clofilac and uh, afazarin, that these systems do have a tendency to under predict uh, in vivo clearance in the in vitro environment for many of these rapidly cleared compounds. A similar study was performed by AstraZeneca, uh, where they too used the same uh, exact lot of primary hepatocytes in comparison between a plated model and the more advanced Hural system. Uh, you can see these results published in uh, Drug Metabolism Disposition in April of 2016. A group at Cipratex, which is another CRO located in the UK, uh, also did a test of the Hurel co-culture system and compared it to uh, hepatocytes in suspension and plated uh, primary uh, hepatocytes of these same lots. And they determined clearance values were much lower than traditional plated hepatocytes using the Hurel system. They also found that of the 12 compounds tested, uh, in the Hurel's in vitro co-culture model, they were able to get a predicted in vivo clearance within threefold for seven of those compounds. So you can clearly see that these more advanced systems offer a very nice prediction as to what can take place in vivo. 
One of the other concerns is not only clearance, but when it comes to metabolite generation and being able to show that uh, you're seeing relevant metabolites being formed, uh, particularly with the FDA's new missed guidance and having to identify certain metabolites that appear at, at greater than, than 25%. Uh, you need a reliable system to ensure that you're not only generating metabolites uh, that you can see in the in vitro environment, but also so you're not surprised when you go in vivo and you see a number of metabolites in vivo that you weren't expecting to see or able to predict with your in vitro system. Uh, AstraZeneca did a very nice publication uh, with the Hurel system and that's published in Molecular Pharmaceutics. And as a snapshot here, you can see with um, warfarin hepatocytes in suspension at two hours on the uh, bottom left-hand corner here that you're forming very little of the M6 metabolite. However, in the hepatocyte co-cultures, uh, you're forming a number of metabolites that are all relevant and all in peer in vivo. Similar results with the folks at Q squared. This was an add-on to the clearance project that I had previously shown. Uh, what Q squared wanted to look at were uh, major metabolites and the possibility that they can be formed uh, accurately in the Hurel uh, system. The study design was a four-hour hepatocyte suspension incubation compared to the Hurel co-cultures all the way out to um, 168 hours or seven days with no media changes. The three compounds selected were meloxicam, timolol, and XK469. And as you can see, on the very top bar here, with the standard hepatocyte four-hour incubation for meloxicam, you see very little formation of the meloxyhydroxy and almost no other metabolites being formed. With the Hurel co-culture system, you're able to generate meloxycarboxylic acid, meloxyhydroxy, many of the in vivo relevant metabolites that you weren't able to predict with your standard classical system. And not only um, can the Hurel co-culture do this, but also some of the other uh, systems, the micro pattern system as well, uh, does a very good job at generating metabolites. Uh, you can see here, uh, again, with timolol, the formation of the timolol glucuronide metabolite, uh, the morpholine ring opening, the loss of the ethyl bridge at 72 hours, and you know, the formation of the in vivo relevant metabolites. The last compound that Q-squared chose to look at was XK469. Uh, this compound was of particular interest because the major metabolite is formed via a non-P450 pathway. Uh, in this case, the major metabolite uh, is formed via the AO or aldehyde oxidase pathway. So they wanted to make sure that not only were P450s expressed, as I showed in the earlier slide from BMS, but also that non-P450s were expressed in the system. And here you can see that the major metabolite being formed via the AO pathway is clearly present and being formed. Q squared published these results uh, just recently in drug metabolism disposition uh, this past August. And here's their takeaway in studies evaluating the hero co-culture system uh, observed incubations using uh, were better than uh, in observed incubations uh, compared to conventional hepatocytes in suspension. Eli Lilly has also done a, a great deal of work in the Hurel system, also looking at qualitative and quantitative prediction of human in vivo metabolites and their pathways. This publish, was published this past year in Xenobiotica as well. So I previously mentioned one of the biggest uh, concerns with some of these more um, uh, advanced systems and, and with compounds that are coming out that are difficult to metabolize is a concern over, are we missing anything? And is there potential for surprises once you do uh, get further along and get into the clinic? And you can see here from these data where uh, the particular client looked at their parent compound in S9 fractions, hepatocytes in suspension, two different fresh hepatocyte donors with compound exposure all the way out to four days, and the Hurel human system. You can clearly see around 27, the significant loss of the parent in the Hurel system, as well as formation of the secondary and tertiary metabolites throughout the uh, spectroscopy scan. So BMS did a, a very nice comparison of our Hurel 
uh, self-assembled co-culture and compared it to bioreclamation IVT's micro-pattern system. What they found is that both of the advanced systems performed very well at examining many of the low turnover compounds that they had screened. One of the uh, advantages uh, or of the more advanced systems is it both far outperformed the traditional plated hepatocytes as well as the uh, HEPA or G cell lines that were plated uh, and ex exposed to compound. Uh, the Hurel system had worked uh, better and predicted better for compounds that tended to be more acidic, while the micro pattern bioreclamation IVT system worked very well for compounds that uh, were more uh, basic on the spectrum. As I previously mentioned, these systems have a do a very good job at exposing the biocanaliculi and forming biocanaliculi for a variety of uh, transporter applications that scientists can do. Uh, here you can see uh, the Purell hepatocyte co-culture of both the human and rat CDF stain and look at beautiful formation of the biocanaliculi. Now, many of these uh, bio experiments come in handy for a number of applications. One direct comparison is to look at uh, an in vitro uh, BC, BDC study or bioduct cannulated study. Uh, these results here were a comparison of the Hurel flux uh, biocanaliculi model in vitro and compared it to what the group Lundquist et al. did where they cannulated directly into the bile ducts of the rats in vivo. And what we show is a uh, comparison within threefold of our in vitro system to what they got in vivo where they cannulated directly into the bile ducts of the rat for both digoxin and almost spot on with resuvastatin. Now what these bile duct studies are, allow folks to do is you can take your in vivo uh, BDC study data, you can take your in vitro BDC uh, data in the rat and also, now you're able to get BDC data in human. Uh, while it's impossible to cannulate directly into the bile ducts of living donors, uh, scientists and researchers can take these three data points and plug them into their more uh, advanced models to get a very nice prediction of what could happen in the clinic. One of the other big uh, advantages of these more advanced systems is their ability to look at uh, compound toxicity over time. Many of the traditional hepatocytes and cell line models only allow uh, very minimal uh, exposure uh, to compounds before the cells themselves become necrotic and, and begin to die off. What these more advanced systems allow is for longer term prediction with the ability to repeat those compounds over an extended period of time. This allows researchers to look at a number of things like drug induced liver injury, as well as coleostatic liabilities, and a number of other more mechanistic um, toxicities that can come up uh, and be presented over time that the traditional uh, standard uh, primary uh, hepatocytes or cell line studies cannot do. One of the examples is a project that we ourselves did with Sanofi, where they looked at 19 well-studied compounds plus 10 of additional Sanofi compounds, all with known delete exposure. These data here show, uh, particularly for compounds like cyclophosphamide and acetaminophen, you can see the dosing over time uh, with the various endpoints. All of these data here are uh, ATP. And you can see for cyclophosphamide, for example, at the 24-hour uh, time point, there's very little toxicity. But as you go out further with exposure over time, uh, the compound becomes more and more toxic as, as picked up in the Hurel system. Similar results for rats and similar results for dog. And you can see in the dog particular that the 7-day and 14-day results are, are almost uh, the same. So the compound shows uh, much more toxic exposure at day seven compared to some of the others. Similar results for acetaminophen. One of the take homes that Sanofi found was their traditional method of looking at human hepatocytes in a monoculture, measuring the TC50s over Cmax at 24 hours. With their traditional method for 
uh, the test set of compounds, they were able to get a prediction of correctly predict six of the 12 toxic compounds how, and seven of the seven non-toxic compounds. What we found is for exposure all the way out to 14 days, we were able to pick up an additional four compounds as toxic. So 10 of the 12 compounds that registered some type of toxic response, again, with no false um, picking up all true negative toxic compounds. Similar results were seen in the rat, though it wasn't as uh, pronounced a pickup. Uh, Sanofi was able to get nine of the 12 predicted correctly for the toxic compounds, where the Hural system picked up 10 of the 12. And similar results for dog, where the Hural system picked up 11 of the 12. The other thing that these more advanced systems can do is they work very well for third-party analytical systems. So for high content analysis, the micropattern system works very well because you can screen in on the little hepatic islands that are formed. Um, it also works very well in a number of time-based impedance readouts, a, a company called ASEA that has a real-time cell analysis uh, machine where you can look at toxicity over time. And these more advanced systems give very accurate predictions of, of what is occurring with your compounds um, in vitro. Other benefits of the more advanced systems are the ability to use these systems as a viral vector. In other words, being able to uh, administer virus, uh, whether it's uh, hepatitis B, malaria, uh, hepatitis C, and, and other viruses to these um, primary hepatic uh, co-culture models to use them as a mechanism to screen uh, therapeutic compounds in development. You can see here that the uh, primary hepatocyte uh, co-culture model with Hurel offers much greater uh, infective rate compared to the traditional hep G2s that are with uh, NTCP uh, as well as some of the other primary cell types. And you can see the Hural models are is the very high bar for uh, at both days uh, 7, 14, and 21 post-infection. So not only are you able to infect the system uh, more easily, but it's able to maintain that those high levels of infection for extended periods of time. Now, many researchers that have worked with viruses such as HBV, uh, particularly with primary hepatocytes, know that there are a variety of donor-to-donor -donor differences with the uh, as it pertains to the ability to infect the cells with a virus. Um, one of the unique things about some of these more advanced systems is their ability to work uh, with a variety of different donors. While you will see some donor-to-donor -donor differences as referenced in uh, plot B here as the uh, exposure with the virus over time, you can see that all five of the donors are clearly above the negative reference control. And this worked for all of the donors that uh, were tested in the more advanced system that virus, it was able to be infected, uh, yes, at, at different levels, but the donor to donor differences were minimalized that every donor tested did have the ability and show the ability to be infected. One of the uh, really fascinating things with these more advanced systems is the ability to not only be infected with virus, but be infected with the virus coming from patient-derived HBV. Uh, this is uh, very unique in that uh, the this, this serum samples were taken and exposed to the cells, and the cells were actually able to pick up some of the, uh, the virus from the, the various patients. And here you can see the um, results for a uh, number of different samples that were tested. Six different samples were tested, and all six uh, different samples showed infection with the uh, patient-derived serum. These more advanced systems not only work well for HBV, but also for malaria. Here you can see the uh, formation of sporozoites inside the cell in a comparison with the Hurel system compared to monocultures of primary hepatocytes. 
As we move to the future, these tissue systems are becoming more and more advanced, uh, essentially creating miniature organs on a plate or chip, as uh, the common lingo is, is referred to in uh, industry. Now, there are a number of different uh, organ on chip systems that are currently uh, some commercially available and some still under development. Uh, what I'm going to touch on is our system that is still uh, currently under in development, but um, on its way and, and should be to the market very soon. Um, what our uh, system is comprised of is a housing with a plate that looks uh, a chip that essentially looks like a microscope slide with each one having an individual uh, set up as an individual experiment. You can see on the top picture on the right hand side, the little red caps are the reservoirs inside the black ring. Uh, those are uh, each different experimental chambers. Inside of that is a two tissue compartment where you can have uh, liver cells, for example, or some other type of gut cells or cardiac cells or some other cell type to look at interactive studies. Here is a, a blow up of the system itself. The white uh, plastic pieces on top are clips that, that hold on the binders. What are fascinating with these organ on chips and microfluidic systems is their ability to predict what happens in vivo. Uh, these are some early results where uh, we looked at uh, monostatic primary hepatocytes plated, monostatic hepatocytes under flow conditions, our Purell static system, and the Purell flow system. And on the y-axis, you can see in vivo uh, measured clearance, and on the x-axis is the scaled in vitro clearance, and looking at the correlation between each one. You can see with the monostatic um, by itself predicted the least with an R-squared value of 0.62, while the Hurel system, both the more advanced tissue model system under microfluidic conditions, had a very nice R-squared correlation. Not only does the system work very well for predicting clearance, but also works very well for looking at metabolite generation. Uh, you can see the results for uh, uh, dextrofan uh, and uh, acetaminophen uh, formation of metabolites in the various systems, whether it be the Hurel flow model, the static model, or the just uh, monostatic model of primary hepatocytes. As I previously mentioned, one of the unique things about these dual-chambered and multi-chambered applications is the ability to look at other tissue types. In particular, here the liver heart kidney, lungs, uh, having a liver and a disease model, as well as some other type of targeted therapeutic. Inside each of these, of these dual chambered systems uh, would be comprised of a liver component, as well as the target tissue component. One of the early experiments that we did with our system was to look at Tegifer, which is a prodrug that gets converted to 5-fluorouracil uh, after it goes metabolism in the liver that the active metabolite is actually the uh, drug uh, that would kill off any of the cancer cells. Here you can see the results with uh, the plus liver component uh, as well as the minus liver component. In the top is a liver component and then in the bottom is a colorectal cancer cell. And you can see the results with plus liver um, the blue is the control. The five is the cytotoxicity that was caused by the tegifer. And the yellow is the cytotoxicity that was comprised just by 5-FU itself. You can see with the plus liver that the tegifer and 5-FU results are almost identical in that it killed off nearly 80% of the colorectal cancer cells in the secondary chamber. Without the liver components, you can see that the tegifer was not converted to the 5-FU, and the red block is very low, where only 2 or 3% of the cells had, had died off, mostly probably because of their own in the, the condition. However, with the 5-FU by itself, you can see that, that worked uh, very well, again, killing off nearly 80% 
of the cells. As we look to the future, uh, one of the ideas is being able to take these organ on a chip systems and uh, make them amenable to a more high throughput application. Uh, one of the thoughts is to have up to 20 or 30 different individual experiments on one single plate, uh, each one with its own uh, reservoir, as well as the two chambered system that can all be analyzed in a uh, its own analyzed housing. So to conclude, uh, there are a number of advantages and, and also concerns as we move towards these more advanced systems. Some of the advantages includes the superior functionality uh, that you get with these more advanced systems compared to the classical uh, research methods that are out there. Uh, the improvements in prediction to be able to predict what can happen in vivo on your desktop is, is certainly very fascinating. Uh, the potential uh, in vitro platforms that can be used for studies of infectious diseases and various disease state models, since they seem to readily take up uh, many of the, the liver diseases that weren't uh, taken up very well with the primary uh, hepatocytes by themselves. Also, as these more advanced systems use comprised of human tissue can also help replace and, and minimize the animal testing that um, is being done. I know in the EU particular, many of these systems have, have really taken off to minimize that um, the use of, of testing on animals. Some of the concerns with these more advanced systems certainly is the organ to organ interplay, or essentially as our bodies, we have our own blood, which works very well with all of our various organs and tissues. However, uh, when you take these systems outside of the body, it becomes very difficult to find a, a media uh, that works best for each one of the individualized tissues, um, particularly with some of the more advanced six, seven, and eight tissue types on a, a culture plate. Uh, it becomes extremely difficult to find a media that works very well for every single type of tissue. Also, some of the regulatory hurdles that many of the agencies are still relying on the classical methods uh, because there just hasn't been enough um, experimentation done with some of these more advanced systems. Though I think many of the regulatory agencies are open to change as the improvements are made in this, these systems and as they be, can continue to become more popular throughout industry. Also, some of these platforms can be rather cumbersome and not necessarily ideal to work with. Uh, also, the, the difficulty with uh, commercialization. Uh, many of these uh, platforms, I, I would say, are somewhat rudimentary and a little academic um, in that uh, as monies become available and these companies begin to uh, develop, uh, Emulate in particular has done a fantastic job of raising money and creating a, a buzz around their platform and you know it's it really uh, rising tide lifts all ships and we're seeing that uh, across the board with a number of these more advanced systems and with that i would like to conclude and thank the folks at, at labroot very well very much and uh thank you i hope you found this uh informative and uh, i really enjoyed uh presenting on some of the more advanced liver tissue model systems that are currently available on the market thank you Thank you, Mr. Shipton, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank Labroots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2019. And as a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any of your questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.